In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will be with child, and you are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be barren is in her sixth month. For nothing is impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. Let it be to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. This is the word of the Lord. Just put your sho- uh, yourself into her shoes for a moment. The angel has just said to Mary that she is going to be pregnant. And she simply asks, how will that happen? Because I'm a virgin. She's not doubting the message. She's not resisting the word that the angel has sent to her. In a moment or two, she will say, let it be to me, as you have said. I'm the Lord's servant. But she just wanted to know Just wanted to have at least some understanding of how this was going to happen. And the answer that the angel gave her was the Holy Spirit. That is how it's going to happen. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And Mary, that is how you will become pregnant. The answer to her question is the Holy Spirit. So who then is this Holy Spirit? Last week we thought about the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. The baby born at Bethlehem on that first Christmas who was Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us and God with us to save us. Today, We ask, who is this Holy Spirit? How does he fit into the Christmas events? What does he have to do with our eternal salvation? And we will answer those questions with words similar to last week. Because like Jesus, the Holy Spirit is fully and truly God. But before we begin to look at that, we need to start elsewhere by saying that the Holy Spirit is truly personal. Now, that's really, really important for us to grasp that. Sometimes people will think that the Holy Spirit is some kind of non-personal, sort of like force. Like some sort of substance or some kind of energy. Or, or people say, well, he's a little bit like my Holy Spirit, about a little bit like my conscience. But somehow don't think of the Holy Spirit as being truly personal. 
Now, part of the reason for that may be that uh, things like water and oil and, and air and fire are all symbols that the Bible uses to describe the Holy Spirit. In addition, the Bible talks about the Holy Spirit being poured out and about us being filled with the Holy Spirit. But that doesn't mean that we should think of him as some kind of substance. You know, we sometimes describe someone as being a little ray of sunshine. We say somebody's a breath of fresh air. We describe them as being the salt of the earth. Oh, we don't mean that literally, do we? We don't mean that's what they are. We're not suggesting for one moment that they are not truly a person. So why can't we let the Bible speak in that same way? We need to get rid of any thoughts of the Holy Spirit as being an object or a substance or a force or even our conscience. The Holy Spirit is fully and truly personal. And we need to then banish any thought that the Holy Spirit is in any way less than being fully God. The Holy Spirit is fully personal as are the Father and the Son and as we shall explore next week, we still believe only in one God. Now in theology, the idea of personal means that we have mind, we can think, we have affection, we can feel, we have will, we can make choices. Being personal means that we have the ability to think and to feel and to make decisions. It means we have the ability to speak and to act. And we see all of that in God the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 2, Paul says that the Spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. And then asks, who knows a person's thought except the Spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows or comprehends or fully gets the deep thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. Do you hear what Paul is saying? Since the Spirit knows and understands all the thoughts and thinking of God, he is equal with God. Indeed, the Spirit is God. He knows and he understands. The Spirit then speaks. And we can find hundreds of examples of that. In Acts 8, he speaks to Philip one day and tells him to go and speak to the Ethiopian in his chariot. The Spirit of God makes decisions. He gives gifts to every one of us as he chooses to give them. And Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would teach us and guide us and lead us and help us. And all of those are personal actions. So please don't think of the Spirit as some kind of substance or some kind of cosmic force. He is not. The Holy Spirit is a person who speaks, who teaches, who makes decisions, and who acts. Who acts, and we, we hear that in our reading today. It's what the angel says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. The Holy Spirit will overshadow you. The Holy Spirit is going to do something. The Holy Spirit is going to work in great power. He will act. And Mary, you will conceive. So this morning I ask you to come and to see all of these qualities, all of these abilities to speak and to think and to act and to feel and to do. They prove to us the true personality of the Holy Spirit. And therefore, as we speak to the Father, and as we speak to the Son, so we may speak to the Spirit. As we honour the Father, and as we honour the Son, so we may honour the Spirit. As we trust the Father, and as we trust the Son, so we may trust the Holy Spirit. For He is personal, and He is God. It means that he has all the attributes of God. 
And the word attribute refers to qualities or to characteristics of a person. And so, for example, God is eternal. God is present everywhere. God is all-powerful. God is infinitely holy and good. And last week we saw how Jesus has all of those attributes. And now this morning, so too, the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is eternal. Hebrews 9 speaks to us of the eternal Spirit. Not created, not beginning sometime, but eternal. Without beginning, without end. Sharing that attribute with the Father and with the Son. And then we know that the Spirit of God is present everywhere. Psalm 139, David asks the question, Lord, where can I go from your Spirit? Where can I go from your presence? And so to go from the Spirit is to go from God. There is nowhere that we go that God is not present. And there is no word that we speak and no action that we do that the Holy Spirit does not hear and see. The Holy Spirit is present everywhere. He shares this divine attribute. And then we can see from our reading today how the Holy Spirit is, is so powerful. That's the message of the angel, isn't it? Mary, you will become pregnant. How? How? Because you're a virgin. How? Because you're not married yet. How? Because of the Holy Spirit. The power of God, the power of the Holy Spirit will be at work within you, Mary. The angel uses that language of overshadowing. I think of like that covering over the tent, the tabernacle. I think of a, a certain covering and a, a concealing or hiding in some way. And so Mary is given some knowledge, some understanding, but there is a mystery here. Conveyed by this overshadowing power of the Holy Spirit, who in his almighty power will ensure that Mary conceives. And then infinitely holy and good. Everywhere in Scripture, the Spirit is called the Holy Spirit. We find it in the Psalms, we hear it in the prophets, we hear it again in the apostles, and it is the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. The Spirit is infinitely holy and good. And Nehemiah acknowledges that as he uh, reflects on the history of his people, of their ups and downs, their comings and their goings, and says, Lord, you gave your good spirit, your good spirit, to instruct them. And so we see that God, the Holy Spirit, has all of those attributes of God that we spoke about last week. But thirdly today, Notice how the Holy Spirit does the works of God. See how we're following the same pattern as we did talking about Jesus last week. He has the attributes of God. So does the Holy Spirit. Jesus does the works that are specifically said to be the works of God. So does the Holy Spirit. And so the Spirit is creator of all things. Isaiah 40 puts it this way. Who has held the dust? In a bucket. Who has weighed the huge mountains in the scales? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord? And Isaiah 40 gives that great ex, uh, sort of a description of God at work in creation. The work of the Spirit. It expands beautifully the statement in Genesis 1. The Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. Sounds similar to this thing of, tabern uh, of, of overshadowing that we will come to. The Spirit of God poised, as it were, for action. And if we ask, what did he do? Then the answer is given there in those words of Isaiah. Marked off the heavens with the breath of his hand. 
the all-powerful Spirit of God, working together with the Father and the Son in the creation of all things. He is our great Creator. But then the Holy Spirit also is our sustainer. Last week we said that it is our Lord Jesus who holds all things together. Well, Scripture says that we draw every breath through the power of God, the Holy Spirit. And yet, Scripture says much more to us about the power of the Spirit of God to sustain us through the trials and the troubles of life. He comforts us. He, he guides us. He, he intercedes for us. He gives us strength to persevere. And remember, the Holy Spirit is doing all of that for millions of Christians around the world, all at the same time. Sustaining us. Elsewhere in Scripture, he's described as the spirit of life. And in particular, of the, the new birth and the, the new life that we are to receive. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit and of water. And it is the Spirit of God who gives to us that new life. But Paul also says that on the last day, when we are raised from the grave, it will be because of the Spirit of God who is in us. So can you see how the Spirit shares in all of these works, all of these actions that are said specifically to be the actions of God. Because God's the only one who can do them all. The Spirit is active in creation, in sustaining, in giving us new birth, and preserving that new life to the end. And so surely when we consider these attributes of the Spirit, these works of the Spirit, we begin to realize that he is indeed fully divine. He is God, the Holy Spirit. He's not a lifeless object. He's not some substance. He's not simply somehow my conscience. The Holy Spirit is personal. He lives, he speaks, he acts, he shares in all the attributes and works of God. And then as we said, of our Lord Jesus last week, the Holy Spirit too has the very nature of God. We understand that because when the Spirit of God speaks, God is speaking. Last week we thought about Isaiah's vision in the temple. When he sees the holiness and the glory of God, it leaves him on his face before the Lord. And remember that John said, Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus. Later in that same chapter, Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord Almighty speaking, saying, whom shall I send? And when Isaiah offers to go, the Lord says, well, yes, go, but understand that the people will hear but they will never understand and grasp it. If you turn to the end of the book of Acts in chapter 28, the Apostle Paul is in Rome. And some of the leaders of the Jews come to listen to him. Some of them are convinced by what he says, others of them don't accept what he's saying, and they argue between themselves. And Paul says, quoting from Isaiah chapter 6, the Holy Spirit was absolutely right when he said that you would hear, but yet not get it. So what we understand then from Isaiah 6 and John 12 and Acts 28 is this. The glory of God Almighty was then and is now revealed in Jesus Christ. And that the voice of the Lord that we hear speaking is the voice of the Holy Spirit. 
to hear the Spirit is to hear God. It follows then, if you turn to Acts chapter 5, that to lie to the Spirit is to lie to God. Acts chapter 5 is that moment in uh, which in their early days the church is just expressing so much generosity and concern for one another. And one couple, Ananias and Sapphira, at least outwardly, appear to be a part of that. They sold a piece of land. They kept back some of the money, which was absolutely fine. They then came and they gave some of the money, which was good. But what they said was, this is everything that we got for selling that piece of land. And that was a lie. And first, the Apostle Peter speaks to Ananias and says, why have you lied to God? Moments later, when his wife comes in and she agrees with what her husband had said, he says, you have agreed with your husband to test or to lie against the Holy Spirit. So to lie to the Spirit is to lie to God. Because the Holy Spirit is God. Psalm 95 speaks of hardening uh, our hearts before God, not listening. And Stephen uses that psalm as he is called to account and says, you have always resisted the Holy Spirit. So to resist the Spirit is to resist God. These and other scriptures too show us that the Holy Spirit is equal with the Father and the Son. Shares with the Father and the Son the one divine nature. For the Holy Spirit is fully God. Now if the truth, if the Bible teaches us that truth, That the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are equally personal, equally powerful, equally share the divine attributes, equally work together in the works of God. And since the Bible also insists there is one only God who is over all, that's what leads us inevitably to the doctrine of the triune God. I'll try and think a bit about that next week. But today, let us... Glory in the work of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. Last week we said that Jesus is God with us. God with us to save us. And our reading of the message of the angel to Mary gives us just a little insight into a little part of the work of the Holy Spirit in our salvation. For it is through the power of God, the Holy Spirit, that God, the Son, the eternal Word, becomes flesh and enters this world. So let us think about the Holy Spirit and our salvation. Here in Luke chapter 1, the angel speaks to Mary, tells her she's been chosen by God. She will conceive and she will give birth to a son. And she must give him the name Jesus. The angel says the boy will be great. The boy will be called the son of the most high. And Mary, I think quite naturally says, well, how is that going to happen? I'm single. I'm a virgin. I will be having no sexual relations until after I am married. That's the point at which the angel says to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. There's the answer to your question. The Holy Spirit, who has the attributes of God, who does the works of God, who shares the essence of God, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, will act in power in your womb, such that you will become pregnant. The eternal word 
will add humanity to his deity through the almighty power and action of the Holy Spirit. It's mind-blowing, isn't it, really? It should humble us before God. It should stir our hearts to praise with all that we've got within us. Like Mary did. I don't think for one moment that she understood all that the angel said to her. I don't think she actually grasped exactly how it was going to happen. But this is what she says. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me as you have said. It was enough to know that God was in control. Enough to know that God understood and that God knew what to do. And that God, the Holy Spirit, would make it happen. Mary had a little help, of course. She knew that in the Old Testament, many times the Spirit of God had come upon people. The Holy Spirit had come upon Samson and given him great strength to lead the people of God. Didn't always act in the best way, but nevertheless, the Spirit of God had come upon him. The Spirit of God came upon the man's soul. It says, changed his heart and made him a new person. Sadly, Saul didn't always live a new life. But the Spirit of God had come upon him. Prophet Ezekiel actually says he felt the Spirit of God enter into him. And now here as we journey through Advent, we see that the angel says to Mary, the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. The next phrase will make it clear that he will come in great power. The power that will enable her to conceive. The power that will perform a miracle within her womb. The power that the Son of the Most High will be born and come into this world. For the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Think perhaps of a large cloud. People sometimes talk of being under a cloud. <laughs> Often though we, we mean we're under suspicion or in a bit of trouble. Maybe we're feeling down. Perhaps things are not working out. But understand that God's overshadowing, God's cloud is, is, is remarkably different. For God's cloud is a cloud of presence and power and blessing. And when the Holy Spirit overshadows you, ah, now that's something very special indeed. And in these words, the Spirit will overshadow you. Bring to mind moments in the Old Testament when God made his presence known in a very visible way. At Mount Sinai, there was thunder, there was lightning, there was a thick cloud over the mountain. And God descended on it in fire. The people knew that God was there, but the cloud kept that sense of mystery. That we can understand only so much. In Exodus 40, we read that the, we read about the, uh, the, the tabernacle, don't we? And we, we described that last week. How it was covered with a cloud. The cloud of the presence of God. I love the story in 1 Kings 8 when Solomon comes to dedicate the temple. And they begin to sing and to praise and to play their music. And then it all has to stop. Not because they've run out of puff to play their instruments, but because the Spirit of God has come in such a powerful way, there's actually nothing they can do. They have to stop. Because God is present. Overshadowing them. The amazing thing that the angel says to Mary is the Holy Spirit will overshadow you. Mary will come under a cloud. Not of suspicion, 
not a feeling down, but the overshadowing cloud of the glory of God. As God the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Blessed Trinity, works a wonder within her womb. And that overshadowing has for me too that sense of guarding the mystery. There's something we can understand about the presence, the power, the blessing of God. And yet the very thought of the Spirit overshadowing her covers something of the miracle that took place. The work of God that we may not know all the details of. We will not understand it all. But we do know that God, the Holy Spirit, was at work. During this season of Advent, we look forward to the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. If we ask the question, how does the Son of God enter this world? The answer from last week is by adding humanity to his deity. The eternal word became flesh and dwelt among us. If with Mary we humbly ask the question, how can this be? The answer is that he is born as a baby. Mary, you will become pregnant. How is that possible? It's possible because nothing is impossible with God. God, the Holy Spirit, overshadowed Mary. And so Jesus Christ was born, the Holy One, the Sinless One, the Man who is God, the Saviour of the world. And this is one of the great works of God the Holy Spirit. So as the carol says, oh come, let us adore him. And that means making ourselves available to the Holy Spirit. We will never be used in the same way that Mary was. That was something quite unique. But we can still say, like Mary did, Holy Spirit, I'm the servant of the Lord. Do what you choose in me. Let us pray together. Lord our God, we thank you for the joy, the wonder, and in some ways the simplicity of the Christmas moments. The birth of a baby. Something we can all grasp and understand. Something that our, our children understand with great joy as we, we celebrate the birth of, of baby Jesus. And understand somehow he is your gift to us. And yet, Lord, at the same time, there is mystery here that we can hardly begin to fathom. Holy Spirit, help us to understand who you are. Help us to relate to you as one who truly is personal. And to honour you as one who is God together with the Father and the Son. And so may we trust you. May we honour you. May we listen to you. May we take your guiding and your leading. And indeed, Holy Spirit, this week, may we, like Mary, simply say, we're your servants. In whatever we have to do, in whatever tasks that are facing us, whatever challenges come our way, of good or of ill, of joy or of sorrow. Holy Spirit, will you work within us? Will you overshadow us that we may know and experience the presence of God at home and at school and in the shop and in our workplace and as we're walking and driving, when we're waking and, Lord, even when we're sleeping? For we simply give what we have. We give our hearts to you and say, Holy Spirit, reign Within us, we pray. 
Amen.